Hi, River of Life Church. It is so good to be back and preaching again. Claire and I were away for three weeks in the U.S. and had the joy of being at Stephen, our son's graduation, with his wife, Shan. And they have been part of a church plant in Sioux Center, Iowa, and are moving down to Louisiana, where they're going to be part of another church, and Stephen hopefully working for a year or so in the States and then seeking God for what next from there. And it was tremendous to be with the New Frontiers USA team, now called Confluence, and to connect with them and see churches being planted and strengthened across the States and beyond the US from that team. And I had such a good time on the way back east in Atlanta, Georgia, with Carl and Virginia Harrington and the teams there and huge link-ups into Mozambique from those churches. And we're going to be hosting a team from there next month, June, in Nampula, Mozambique. So overall, a fantastic trip. Uh, we are, I think, getting over the jet lag. And one of the amazing things being out there was interacting with River of Life from the other side of the Atlantic. And the reality of the vibrancy that I felt hearing from the different teams, connecting in with the messages. And I feel an incredible favor of God on our church. I'm so grateful for the huge connection with this series on Eagerly Desire the Spiritual Gifts, how you connected with Toppy and his incredible message to the pastors at Bethlehem Church, John Piper and friends. And I've heard such good reports that he was excellent on the first week and even better on the second week. He really is an outstanding speaker and I think laid a very good platform and foundation. And just hearing from Andrew Ellis and Mus Maramuidze on the uh, GP and Eastly side of the way that the different congregations have engaged with prophecy, praying for each other, hearing from God for one another. And uh, I, I do imagine a church more and more alive in the spiritual gifts. And I'm looking forward to the next weeks coming up next week. Dave and Liz Holden are with us, and it's the 25th year anniversary of River of Life Church. We're going to be all together at Gateway High School, and Dave is going to speak into the gifts of the Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Please don't miss next week. Do everything you can to be there. 9.30 at Gateway High School, and I know there's going to be lunch afterwards. There's a bring in bribe, but there's also uh, chicken and rice and sudza and relish for everybody. And there's going to be games and sport afterwards. So that's a real highlight to look forward to. And I think this is all part of being a people of God's spirit, a community in his presence, loving one another and loving the world overflowing from that. Thank you also for your generosity and giving. And may I encourage you to do that all the more in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the strain in Zimbabwe, to be prayerful, going to God, with what we've earned and saying, God, how do we honor you and bring the first fruits of our labors to you as worship? I'm grateful for the faithfulness thus far. And I just want you to know how much we appreciate that and rely on that, even with these big events coming up like this 25th. And the gift day is going to happen on Sunday as well. We're going to have a slot in that Sunday meeting for giving over and above tithes and offerings, just bringing a love offering together. We're hoping for 25000 for our 25th anniversary to put into various capital projects that we've got going on. So with that said, we dive in today to this one on tongues and interpretation of tongues. And I'm very excited about this, praying that God will use this mightily in your personal relationship with Him and flowing from that blessing and influencing others. Shall we pray together? Father, thank you so much that you have caused your life to be made known amongst us in the person of Jesus Christ. And that Jesus overcame the grave, ascended to heaven and poured out his Holy Spirit, has given gifts to the church for the building up of the saints for the works of ministry. Lord, we thank you so much for your gifts. Jesus, we thank you so much for your spirit and your presence with us. And we pray that we would be a people of the spirit. I pray that we would not be a people of the flesh. 
but that we'd be a people of the Spirit, that we would know your word and your power working together, changing our lives and changing others through us. I pray for a spiritual message today. I pray for a message that hits our heart, that hits deep, that draws us into prayer, draws us into real relationship with you, not something cerebral only, but something spiritual that transforms the mind and every part of our being by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, please would you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts. I know of no better place really to start on a message on tongues than from Acts 2, because Acts 2 pivots from the old into the new and you get that moment where Pentecost happened, the Holy Spirit was poured out, tongues was experienced for the first time in this way, and they identified immediately with what had happened in the Old Testament and ushered in a whole new era which had been prophesied in the Old Testament. So Acts chapter 2, verse 2, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arab, uh, Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Old men dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And on goes Joel's words. Peter continued to preach that uh, this Jesus who was crucified was Lord and Christ. Verse 36, let all of the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What shall we do? Repent and believe in the name of Jesus Christ, verse 38, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children, just as Joel had prophesied, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And that then leads into the passage that we've preached from extensively in the series called Make Disciples, A Lifestyle of Making Disciples 7, verse 41 to 47. And what that church looked like, a people now full of God's spirit, having walked with Jesus, now experiencing his presence in them, and what that first New Testament church looked like. Large group, small group, give group, in homes, in workplace, beyond their comfort zone, in God's word and in prayer. 
But today, as we look at tongues, this is something so, so special. And uh, the apostles instinctively explained what was happening by referring to the prophecy in Joel. And Joel chapter 2 had said that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, all those who believe in him, all of God's people. And God's people understood that the spirit uh, really sealed or, or ratified or characterized God's people, God's presence, and God's power. That was their experience. They had experienced his spirit affirming that they are his people. They were the people of Baal. They were the people of uh, different gods of the different places. But the God of Israel was alive. He, he manifested as a pillar of fire, a cloud. He manifested as water out of a rock. They understood the Spirit affirming them as the people of God. They understood the Spirit affirming His presence among them. When the cloud moves, move as well. And he un they understood the Spirit affirming God's power in their lives, defeating their enemies and various miracles that were done. But it was always associated with one person or a small group of people, those particular servants that God chose upon whom his spirit rested, be it Moses or Daniel or David or whoever was anointed. But these words of prophecy were coming, that there's coming a day, this new kingdom where the spirit will be poured out on all of God's people. He will give them a new heart, Ezekiel talks about. I, no longer my law written on tablets, but by the Spirit in your hearts. This new day of the kingdom of God. And very often, the disciples confused that kingdom with the kingdom of this world. And they imagined that perhaps this power of the Spirit would usurp or dethrone Caesar would wipe out Rome, would cause Israel to be a superpower on earth. They interpreted a lot of this prof prophetic uh, direction as being fleshly, kingdoms of man. And really up to this point, that was where they were. Up to the point that Jesus was crucified, Peter was still cutting off the ears of opposition. They were still in fighting, saying, who will sit on his left? Who will sit on his right? But amazingly, when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, everything fell into place. They never looked back. They gave their lives for this cause. They saw a kingdom that is not a kingdom of this world but a kingdom of the Spirit that is in this world, but not of this world. A kingdom in the heart. A kingdom of obedience from the heart by the Spirit. And Paul writes in Romans, the kingdom of God is a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. They got it. This kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It is a kingdom that is not dependent on this world. It, no matter what happens with the rulers and powers of the day, no matter what happens with economics, no matter what happens with health and wealth, it is a kingdom that transcends all of this. It is a kingdom of the Spirit. And while we live, there will be these different powers. Today, as I preach the Queen in England is celebrating her platinum jubilee, 70 years on the throne. What a woman! She takes a stronger and stronger stand for the gospel as she gets older. Such an inspiring person, but she will pass. And who knows who will come after her? Probably Charles. And who knows who will come after him? Probably William. Who knows who will probably come after him? Probably George. And who, etc., etc. And in every nation, there's this transition. But there's a kingdom that transcends it all. A kingdom of the Spirit. And it is so spectacular that the ushering in of this kingdom 
happens with tons of fire on the heads of those who are gathered together, expecting, just as Jesus said, wait for my promised spirit. And they start speaking in tongues. This is the sign that God's spirit is poured out on all those who have received him and believed in his name. And it's a sign that the temple curtain has been torn in two and that the gospel can be heard in every language. You don't just have to be able to speak Hebrew. It's heard in every language, every tongue. The gospel's for everyone. I'm always amazed that Islam is a religion where, where you have to form up underneath that one language. You have to understand Arabic. To read the Quran in Arabic is the actual real translation of what God said. The dictation of what God said in Arabic. And yet the, the life of Jesus is earthed, incarnated in our existence in all our different tongues. And amazingly, the apostles then moved through Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth and brought this experience of the Holy Spirit to all who believed. Many people received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues or other evidences, speaking the word of God boldly or other miracles at the same time that they believed. Boom, boom. They believed in Jesus, received the Holy Spirit. That happened to Cornelius and his family later in Acts. But there were others who believed, born again by the Spirit of God, but hadn't yet received the gift of the Holy Spirit in the sense of the filling or the baptism in the Spirit, the experiential, uh, tactile, uh, known closeness of the Holy Spirit. And to be clear, tongues is not the sign that you are a Christian, not the sign that you are filled with the Spirit. All of that happens deep in the heart. But tongues is one of the signs that showed that people were filled with the Spirit. The reality is when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are born again by the Spirit. That is a work that happens deep within our hearts. Only God can see that. And when we ask Him to fill us with His Holy Spirit, He says, those who ask for my Holy Spirit, like a child asks for an egg, the parent won't give him a scorpion, so I will give the Holy Spirit. That happens with outward show, outward demonstration. In every single instance in the Bible, there is an evidence that this is God's people. This is God's presence. This is God's power. For many, tongues is one of those signs. Certainly that was my experience. But for others, there are some, even many, who are filled with the Spirit, know the power of God in different ways, but perhaps don't speak in tongues. My personal opinion is that we can all step out in all the gifts of the Spirit. All step out and pray for the sick and see them healed. All step out in prophecy, in tongues, and in interpretation of tongues. But they're not badges that sort of make us better Christians. Rather, eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. And tongues is such an excellent one to start with. I'd love to give you some uh, personal encouragement on tongues and interpretation of tongues. Ephesians 5 verse 18, much like Acts chapter 2 here, Ephesians 5 verse 18, Paul is enc encouraging believers to be filled with the Spirit in an ongoing way. Not just in the sense of you've received Christ Let's lay hands on you for the filling of the Spirit, which Paul did at every instance. He made sure they were filled with the Spirit. Not just that kind of first baptism, but an ongoing filling. He says here in Ephesians 5 verse 18, Do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spirit. Spiritual songs, singing joy and making melody to the Lord with your heart. And I, I think about us in Zimbabwe and the huge strains and how we're tired. And 
the difference between an American experience and a Zimbabwean experience is sometimes very stark. Uh, I, I got back home two days ago and just yesterday I was helping one of the teens in our church with a zip it uh, amount because a policeman had stopped her 10 a.m. on June the 1st checking her license. And it's almost like there's this mechanism in place where, where we're trying to get as much money as we can from people. And police not necessarily helping us, but being there to pounce on us and catch us doing things wrong. Now, there's many things that are wrong in America, but certainly the police that I bumped into were incredibly helpful. And in one instance where we were over the speed limit, I said, please, look after your speed. I don't want to give you a ticket. Calm down. And there's a different atmosphere. I think in our scenario, we need to be filled with the Spirit, not drunk on wine, not dealing with these challenges with other mechanisms, but being filled with the Spirit. I think if you live in Zimbabwe today, you, as a believer, the best, best advice I could give you is pray in the Spirit as much as you can. Be filled by the Spirit. And this is an ongoing present tense. In the, in the original, it's in the aortus tense. Be being filled. Let your disposition be one of continually being filled by the Holy Spirit. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Live being filled by the Spirit, a dependency on God. Romans 8 is the scripture that I read when I received the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. It says much the same. It says the Spirit intercedes. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what, we, what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I read that and I, I knew I needed help with prayer. I knew I needed help to be filled with the Spirit. As Jude says, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit on all occasions. And I read these scriptures and I was in a dorm at school. Others could could, uh, you know, we were in beds next to each other, so I pulled the bedclothes over and put the, ta the pillow over my head, and I just started to go, oh. and I found I was praying from my spirit. Oh. I was like, I'm alive. I, God's spirit is within me, and I'm praying by his spirit. I think that's often how baptism in the spirit happens. What is in us comes out. It's like an overflowing. Uh, Jesus said, streams of living waters will flow from your belly. That's what it is to experience his spirit. In a way, it's like it comes upon you, or he, the spirit, comes upon you. In another way, it's like he overflows from you. And tongues is such a helpful way to experience this. So I went, oh, and then I started using words. Hey, mama. And I thought, I'm, I'm just going to keep doing this. And then the next morning, going walking to school, I tried to do it without talking, just doing it inside. And it also worked. Not quite as good, but I could feel it. Literally feel it. For me, it wasn't like a lightning bolt. Some people talk about electricity flowing through them. When I gave my life to Christ and I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I do remember seeing like a whiteout um, and just the sense that he has given me freedom. He's given me complete cleanness in his presence. But receiving his spirit and praying in tongues, it was something I felt, not necessarily like electricity or anything, but something that built me up on the inside. The last scripture I'd like to look at is 1 Corinthians 14. We'll close with this. I, I hope it will be really useful, particularly in di uh, differentiating between the private gift of tongues and the public gift. 
uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. No one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Obviously, if your gift of tongues is in another earthly tongue and someone happens to be able to speak that language, that's an instance like happened in Acts 2. But in most instances, the tongue that we speak is a tongue of men and angels, the scripture says, and won't be understood by anybody else. For no one understands it, but he utters mystery in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their building and encouragement. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. I would love all in River of Life to speak in tongues, but even more for all to prophesy. And that's what this series is really all about. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so the church may be built up. And uh, this is the beautiful thing that tongues can be interpreted in the public setting. And the word interpret is such an important word. It's not necessarily translate, but interpret. So this is a spirit-to-spirit -spirit dynamic that is going on. When somebody brings a public gift of tongues, we hear in our spirit, what is the sense of that tongue? And then when we feel God has given us the interpretation of what that person is saying in the spirit, we come forward and bring that expression in the known language that most people would understand. And uh, I'll just finish up with a couple of don'ts and a couple of do's. Two don'ts when it comes to tongues. First of all, don't think that tongues is the only sign for being born again or the only sign to be filled with the Spirit. I really want you to be free of that and to know the joy of eagerly designing, de desiring the spiritual gifts, being assured of your salvation by grace through faith. You put your faith in Jesus, and that's what saves you. You ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit, and you can trust that he is filling you with the Spirit. And the outward expression of that, let that come in its time, whatever shape and form that is. The second don't on tongues is don't use tongues as a, a badge of honor or, or where it shouldn't be used. Sometimes I hear people preaching and they, they kind of feel like they've hit a really good point and then they'll say, and then continuing preaching. Almost like they have to speak in tongues a bit while they're preaching. And I, I think that's not going to help anyone. It almost says... You know, this is the man of God. He's so spiritual that every now and then he has to break out into tongues. I don't see Jesus doing that. I don't see any of the apostles doing that. That wasn't an example set for us in Scripture. In fact, quite the contrary. I'd say the three do's. Number one, pray in tongues in your secret place. Pray personally and experience the joy of the Spirit of God personally. When I wake up in the morning, it is as cold and as dark for me as it is for you. It's as difficult for me to open up my Bible and pray and read Scripture as it is for you. But one thing that's true for me is when I speak in tongues, it does change things. And I often start by just praying for a couple of minutes in tongues. And tongues is such an interesting one because your mind will say, oh, it's rubbish, it's nothing, it's nothing. But your spirit gets built up. And I often think about Peter stepping out of the boat when Jesus said to him, come to me. Peter didn't wait for him to be levitated by the Spirit of God and for his legs to walk like a zombie. No, Jesus said, come to me, just like he says, speak in tongues. Uh, 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 Paul says, I pray in the Spirit, I pray in the understanding. We make the decision to pray in tongues and we make the decision to stop. In the, in the amazing design of God, we are part of the miracle. We engage with the Spirit 
in our flesh in that sense. It's literally our decision to speak, to make those voices. And yet God does the miracle. As Peter stepped out of the boat, God made him walk on water. And as we articulate words that we cannot understand from the heart, God enables the gift of tongues. So that's the first do. Pray in the Spirit by yourself. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And if you don't speak in tongues yet or aren't able to get there, feel free to invite us to lay hands on you to be filled with the Spirit. That was a very biblical way that it happened. For me, it happened just on my own. And then I went to church and got people to lay hands on me to be filled. And I just did the same thing. I prayed the same things. And I said, oh, great. So I've got it. But eagerly desire the spiritual gifts and outwork them in the secret place personally. Secondly, uh, use tongues corporately. Feel free in corporate meetings, corporate prayer meetings, there will be times that we all pray in tongues together. And that's great. Again, it is prayer to God. It is expression of the Spirit to God. And that leads to my third do, and that is with the public gift of tongues, do have interpretation. And the interpretation will always be Godward. So uh, the interpretation of a tongue will never be, thus says the Lord, you are my people who I love. That is not an interpretation of a tongue. That's prophecy. That is God's word to people. A tongue is always prayed to God. So the interpretation of a tongue will always be to God. Father, my soul delights in you. My spirit rejoices in you, my God and King. You are above all the earth. You hold all things together. That the interpretation of the tongue will always be a worship to God. As we head into the next couple of weeks, I'm looking forward to the time with Dave Holden. And I know that he's going to be speaking into this. I believe River of Life is on the edge of a whole new expression of prayer and experience of the Holy Spirit. I really want to encourage you to eagerly desire these spiritual gifts. Not to worry if they don't come immediately. There's so many testimonies of people who receive the Holy Spirit over a period of time. But step out. Step in. Step up. Let's trust God to be a spiritual people. The kingdom of God, not of this world, but in this world and bringing many people into this experience of his spirit. Shall we pray? Father, thank you so much that you know us so intimately, have saved us so deeply that you enable us to experience your spirit, to know that we are your people. Even as you said, the Spirit cries, Abba, Father. That we can know your presence. We can know your power. Not only being born again and justified forever, but being sanctified by that same power of the Spirit as we continually be filled. Lord, I pray that as we eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, you would help us to pray in tongues in our personal space. Pray in tongues in prayer meetings with others and know the joy of being built up in our most holy faith. And even, Lord, that we would have tongues and interpretation in our public meetings. I pray, Lord, we'd even have tongues of other languages where people hear your praises in their own tongue and say, surely God is among you. Lord, we ask for an increasing intensity of the knowledge of being your people, the knowledge of being in your presence and the knowledge of experiencing your power. We pray this in Jesus' name and for your glory, Lord. Amen. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday at Gateway High eagerly desire his gifts. God bless you.